Hello, and welcome to Zoom with Zarni. I'm Dustin Zarni, Democratic Elections Commissioner here in Onondaga County, and this is my weekly interview show. Coming up this week, I have Dana Balter and Karen Wharton of Citizen Action New York. We talk a great deal about the public campaign finance system here in New York and uh, and why they're requesting more money from the budget. Uh, we I appeared on a panel with Karen Wharton just a uh, a little bit over a week ago now, and uh, she was incredible then, and I, I'm so glad that she came on. And of course, Dana Balter, uh, old friend of the program and old friend of us here in Onondaga County. Uh, I will this you know this week at the Board of Elections, we're getting ready for the start of petitioning next week. Uh, signature requirements should be going up on our website sometime today on onvote.net, and we're preparing lists for voters. Uh, and, and, and candidates to go go around. So if you need help uh, running for uh, office, check out last week's seminar, my Zarni seminar on getting on the ballot, but uh, also give us a call and we'll be able to help you out. So with that being said, uh, I'm happy to present my uh, Zoom interview with Dana Balter and Karen Wharton of Citizen Action New York. Enjoy. And we're back, and I'm very happy to have uh, two good friends of mine, Dana Balter uh, uh, and uh, Karen Wharton of Citizen Action. Uh, we're, you may know Dana. You may not know Karen. She this is her first time on the program. But it is my pleasure to have both of them back. Dana and Karen, thank you so much for coming on Zoom with Zarni. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Dustin. So, Dana, um, you, both of you represent Citizen Action, and I, I would love for you to talk, remind viewers a little bit about what Citizen Action is and what you do. Great. Um, Citizen Action is a statewide membership organization that works to bring about real justice for all New Yorkers. We believe in a vision of this state and the world where everyone has what they need to thrive. And that means racial just, justice, social justice, economic justice, environmental justice. We have seven chapters um, across the state and an affiliate on Long Island. Uh, and we work in communities to help people realize their own power, learn how to organize, and learn how to make real change at the local and state level. Um, we're really excited right now. We're in the middle of a very busy legislative session, as you know. And just this week, uh, we had a big event statewide. All of our chapters participated in a regional lobby day where members of our chapters in each of our seven regions first held a press conference to tell the community about the things that we're fighting for this year, and then went on a series of lobby visits to their state senators and assembly members offices, uh, something that I know a lot of your listeners and viewers love to do. <laughs> and um, what we we're talking about this week is our legislative platform for the year, which we call our justice agenda. And um, it is a series of um, bills and bill packages that we're working to get passed at the state level across seven different issue areas. We work on everything from healthcare and climate to uh, public money and uh, what we call possibility not punishment, which is about ensuring that our criminal legal system um, brings about real justice um, and equality under the law. And um, we are, really excited about the things that we're advocating for this year. Um, I hope we get to sort of talk about some of them tonight. I know with Karen here, we're going to um, really dig deep into our issues around democracy and particularly public campaign finance, which is 
one of the big things on our justice agenda this year. Um, and I feel very lucky to be here with two of the best democracy experts I know in New York State uh, to talk about it. Well, let's talk about it now because we are going to, Karen, we are going to get into CPFB. Karen and I uh, last week uh, testified together and uh, we're going to, and it was a great uh, panel of testimony. And we are going to put a link in the show notes for uh, those of you who want to get a little bit deeper into the agenda. But before we get back into, into CPFB, Dana, let's get into these uh, these other uh, tenants. What are some of the other tenants that uh, you're having these press conferences this week that you want to put a spotlight on? Um, yeah, so we are fighting for the things that uh, our communities know we need to thrive, right? So uh, we're working for universal child care because we are still stuck in a situation where too many families cannot access or afford good care for their kids. We want to make sure not only do they have it, but that it's developmentally, intellectually, and culturally appropriate for every kid. We are um, fighting as always to better our education system. So all of our kids have access to excellent education no matter their zip code. And this year we're focused on a bill called Solutions Not Suspensions, which is about making sure that what we are providing good mental health resources and other therapeutic supports in schools rather than relying on suspensions as punishment that take kids out of school and interrupt their ability to learn. Um, we are working to end medical debt. Folks here in Onondaga County, I'm sure, have read lots of stories about what's going on with our local hospitals. And um, we are in a, a pretty tough situation where a lot of the public money that we have allocated at the state level to help people pay for their care is not actually being um, given to patients. So we're working on changing that circumstance and making sure that all of that money actually makes its way to patients to help them get the care that they need. We are working on um, some issues that we call possibility, not punishment, um, helping us reimagine the way that we deal with community safety and um, help ensure that people have the resources they need to be safe in their communities. Um, one of the bills there is called Treatment Not Jails, where we are working on ensuring that our response to people in mental health crisis or to people who have substance use disorder is to provide them with the mental health and substance use disorder services they need rather than throwing them in jail. Um, we are also working on ensuring that we have all of the public money we need to invest in these things. And the way we do that is by making sure we in, uh, insist on the ultra wealthy and corporations paying what they owe. And that means closing tax loopholes, making sure that um, billionaires are not paying less in taxes than firefighters and school teachers. Um, so those are, are some of the things. There are a few more in there, and I would encourage folks who are interested to go to the link that you share. Um, our website is citizenactionny.org, and all of this information is there, along with opportunities to get involved in, and get into the fight to make sure that we win on some of these really, really key issues this year. Excellent. Thank you, Dana. Now, Karen, you're, we, we are new friends, <laughs> and, and I'm not, well, I know we've met before, but we just last week had the pleasure of uh, spending about 40 minutes together uh, on a panel uh, for the New York State uh, local budget hearings. And I know we're going to talk a lot about CPFB, but how, and a lot of that was talked about at that panel, but how do you think that went? What was your uh, reflection on uh, our testimony last week? Well, uh, thank you for having me, first of all, and it's great to be here with uh, the great, uh, lovely Dana. 
Uh, I'm really loving this tonight. Um, uh, it felt pretty okay, uh, our testimony. I mean, I think overall it was good. Uh, I was surprised at some of the questions, uh, but then again, not too surprised. So I'm really grateful that we had the opportunity uh, to talk about these things that are very meaningful to New Yorkers uh, and to be able to uh, basically petition our government as we as is our right. Uh, so I appreciated the opportunity to speak about the public campaign finance and uh, program, uh, the newly launched uh, statewide program here in uh, New York, uh, because I think uh, it is a very important component of our democracy. And our democracy is what drives all of the issues that uh, Dana mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, it is what moves the needle. And so I, I when I talk to folks, talk to activists and so on, I say, hey, you know, when you go to Albany uh, to petition your government, when you have these, you know, actions, it is because you're practicing democracy. It is part of democracy. So I'm really excited that New York State is now leading uh, 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 in terms of uh, reforming campaign financing. And I'd love to speak, of course, you know, I'll probably speak all night about it because I'm really passionate about it. Uh, but I, I'd love we, to share. We probably will. <laughs> we'll, we'll at least spend at least another half hour talking about it. But so, you know, we keep, you know, talking about CPFB um, and we use these terms, but it's the Campaign Public Finance Board. Tell the viewers how this works. I think, you know, this is brand new to New York. We've never done anything like this before. So what is the program itself? What is Campaign Public Finance? So at the heart of it is it is using public money for public good. Uh, but let's peel away and get dive a little bit deeper. Uh, when last year, so we did some analysis of uh, who and how the camp how last year's uh, campaigns were funded, uh, state campaigns were funded. And we found that this is by the, uh, the, the study was done by the Brennan Center uh, in collaboration with Open Secrets. And what uh, they discovered is that uh, 200 uh, New Yorkers, wealthy no donors, the top donors donated $16 million to state candidates last year. 206,000 New Yorkers uh, donated to get collectively thirteen million dollars, and they and this is using like the small donor two fifty two hundred and fifty dollars or less. And so what it's what it really is saying is that we have two hundred wealthy New Yorkers who are pumping a lot of money into how campaigns are financed. So we want to amplify the voices of our ordinary people because they're more ordinary people than they are. Uh, fabulously wealthy people. Uh, so Citizen Action, along with other groups, other uh, community organizations, unions, activist groups, good government groups, and so on, uh, after about, after over 12 years of advocacy, uh, we were able to um, pass this program, have this program uh, made into law, uh, where Ordinary people are now going to be able to uh, um, make small donations to candidates of their choice. And the smaller the donation, the, uh, the, the state will then match and uh, give a multiplying effect. Uh, so if you give $5, for instance, to your favorite candidate, the state will match it uh, 12 to 1. So your $5 actually becomes 12, five, six, $65 uh, to your favorite candidate, right? And what that does is that it basically begins to, uh, to, to, to level the playing field a little bit so that someone who is living from paycheck to paycheck and can just barely afford $5, right? 
uh, can really um, support their candidate in a much more substantive way and, and hopefully be able to match the power of wealthy donors. If they're more of us than they are of wealthy folks. So if we got together and, uh, and, and, and pool our resources, we'll be able to really have a greater say in our democracy. That's amazing. Uh, so yesterday there was, or I'm sorry, last week uh, in our testimony, uh, there was an interesting question that was posed by, well, there were several interesting questions. And please go watch the testimony because uh, it was interesting all around. But one of the questions that ended the panel was one of the things that I think we hear the most uh, for the people who want to detract from this uh, public finance system, which an assembly member likened, uh, you know, using money for public finance as taking away money from a uh, daycare center or using taxpayer money for politics. You had a great answer uh, on that. I, I hope that you can kind of share that again, because I think, I think it was uh, one of the best uh, explanations and one that I'm probably going to steal uh, and use when people ask me. So, but Karen, wh what is your response for when people say you're using taxpayer money for politics and, and it's taking away from other programs? Sure. So if you look at how how programs are, uh, are, are allocated or are budgeted, uh, Legislators get into a room and they decide, or someone decides, how this pie, how the pie should be cut, uh, who should get what size of slice. So I think that when the pie is, is pretty big, right? The pie is, is very large, right? I can't, I, I mean, I'm not that good at math. I can't even tell you how big. It's like billions of dollars. The New York state budget is, is billions of dollars, okay? So I'm always taken aback when a legislator says, I can't spend money on this because I need to give $10 million to that. But we, we just, we're, we've, we've, we fund things that, you know, we, we just funded, um, uh, I wonder if I should say this, but I'm going to just go out on a limb and say this. We're spending almost a billion dollars on uh, on a stadium in Buffalo, right? Okay, now who decided that? Who made that decision? So if you're telling me that uh, we have to make a choice between public campaign financing or between program A and program B, I'm like, well, the reason why that's happening is because we don't really have the right people at the table making the decisions in the first place. So where public campaign financing comes in is that it gives ordinary people like us a greater say, right, in who actually gets on the ballot, right? And we get to choose people who, are re who will better represent our values. And also, since there's fundraising, since the candidates have to come into the community and ask us for five and ten dollars, we have an opportunity to actually engage our, 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 our representatives or future representatives. We get to tell them, you know, eyeball to eyeball, hey, you know, childcare is very important to me. So when you get in, you need to make sure that childcare is important is, is is included in the budget. So Having this conversation after the fact is telling me that, hey, my representative was not really like pushing for childcare in the first place. This is why I'm kind of like back on my heel, begging him or her or they at the last moment to please include it. So I'm trying to, I, I, I would like us to have um, practice in New York, right, in the state of New York, where our values are actually are reflected in the budget. And we don't necessarily have to go kind of like hat in hand saying, oh, please uh, fund my childcare. 
I, I was flabbergasted when it, when the, the when the elected said that. I'm like, why, why, why was childcare not included in the budget in the first place? You know, why are you saying? Why are you having your your constituents come into the office to essentially beg for childcare? And so now you're going to pivot and say, oh, the child care is so important. I can't fund democracy, which will help the woman to actually pay for child care in the first place. So it's a little long winded. But I think that um, I think we need to uh, get to a place where we have a budget that truly reflects our values. And I believe that amplifying the voice of ordinary people uh, giving them a chance to select people they think best, best represent their uh, interests, their concerns, will actually get there. One other thing I'd like to say, <laughs> to, I'd like to mention. Uh, so, you know, I go around and I speak with uh, legislators, people that we've all, uh, you know, voted in. And one person told me straight up, I'm, a, I'm opposed to this. Because it's gonna, I'm opposed to uh, having uh, these, uh, having ordinary, uh, the monies of ordinary donors be amplified. Uh, because I don't think we should spend it that way. I don't think we should spend uh, uh, the uh, spares money that, that way. It'll just encourage people to primary me. And I'm like, uh, that's democracy. And then uh, the person said, because uh, I, then I pointed out, this is a purely voluntary program. If you don't like it, you don't have to opt in. And a legislator says, well, I don't get my money from in-district constituents. And I'm like, OMG, this is a problem. Who are you representing? If you're not, if if your if your constituents are not funding your campaign, and you don't have a problem telling, saying this publicly, Houston, we have a problem. You are not really representing your constituents. You are representing whoever is giving you the money. So, in the public campaign finance uh, program. We basically, in order to qualify, uh, a candidate has to meet two thresholds. A candidate has to uh, raise a certain amount of money from in-district uh, donors and from a certain number of in-district donors. We're not saying you can't get money, you can't raise funds from out, you know, outside entities. But we want you to concentrate, please, if you're gonna take, if you're gonna get public dollars, you need to go out, knock on doors, have that barbecue, uh, have that picnic, talk to people in your districts, meet them, eyeball to eyeball, eyeball to eyeball, have them tell you what their concerns are. Right. And so I have a 92 year old mom. When Obama was running, she was he would dial her for num for dollars and she would give him ten dollars here, ten dollars there. On election day, you could not hold her back from going down to the polling side. She was vested. She felt she had a relationship with him. Right. And if he were local, I guarantee you. Just with ten dollars here or there, my mom fixed income can't give thousands of dollars. At most, she probably gave him fifty bucks, ten dollars five times. But you, you can rest assured that if he were local, she'll hobble down to his office and say, "Hey, I'm your supporter, and I want you to, to know these are the things that I am looking for." And if he doesn't provide it, next time around when he calls, there'll be no money. So with uh, the new program, uh, we see it uh, as, a, as a mechanism of bringing candidates closer to their constituents. 
And in this in in this situation, I believe we all win. Yeah, democracy. I, I like how uh, you know you, you you mentioned that like it shouldn't be an either or thing with the daycare example. Like, and I I don't want to call this assemblyman out by name or anything like that because I don't know this, but oftentimes when I hear this type of uh, choice being made is a false choice because they didn't want to fund the other thing either. They just don't want to fund either of them, and they're playing off against each other uh, and, and 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 not doing that. Now, Dana, you Justin, were a can I? Yeah, yeah I want I, I want to get you in there. <laughs> so, can I jump in for a second on yeah. this particular point? Yeah. Um, so, I think it's really important for people to understand. First of all there is plenty of money to fund all of these things. We, we are the richest country, we are the richest state in the richest country in the history of the world. There is plenty of money for childcare and education and healthcare and housing. And when somebody like this assembly member says, why should I spend money on public financing instead of childcare? They are presenting you with a false choice. There's plenty of money to do both. And the way we make sure that we can fund both is by making the ultra wealthy and corporations pay what they owe. It's when we let them evade taxes. It's when we let them take advantage of loopholes. It's when we let them pay less in taxes than teachers do that we have a problem with resources. So really what that question is, is code. It is code from the GOP uh, that's, really saying, we want to maintain the status quo. We are interested in keeping the system rigged in favor of the ultra wealthy and corporate interests. We don't want the ordinary person in New York to have a loud voice to be able to increase their influence in politics, because if they do, we will have to respond to their needs instead of to this elite set of wealthy operators. And what is so important about public campaign financing is that it eliminates their ability to keep the system rigged in favor of the ultra wealthy. And that is how ensuring that every person, everyday New Yorkers, can participate in our democracy is how we make sure that we meet our needs on education policy. It's how we make sure that our state legislature enacts tenant protections so people can stay in their homes. It's how we make sure that the state legislature finally makes all those giant investments in fighting the climate crisis so that we can have healthy, safe, and resilient communities. If we care about achieving those things, investing in those resources that allow us and our communities to thrive, healthy democratic participation is the way we make that happen. That's what this is really about. And that's why I'm not as kind as you are to keep identity secret. That's why Assembly Member Manktelo is arguing with Karen and the other people coming before the committee to fight for this program. Because he wants to keep things the way they are. The people on the side of democracy want a state that represents the needs of all New Yorkers. <laughs> and and that's fine. It, it was Assembly Member Maitalo, and uh, it, you're right. <laughs> we don't we don't need to be that kind. It's on public record anyways. Uh, Dana, I, I want to get your perspective as a former candidate. Even though um, the system is in place right now doesn't reach congressional um, levels yet. Uh, as a former candidate, a first-time candidate, a, a candidate that wasn't part of a big system, you didn't come from another office, you didn't have a campaign fund when you first started in 2018, how beneficial would it have been to have a small donor 
matching system? It would have been a game changer. Um, because of my experience as a candidate, I am extra excited <laughs> that New York has this new program. Uh, for all the reasons Karen outlined, as a candidate who was focused on representing the people and strengthening democracy, the idea of being able to tune out ultra wealthy donors and special interests and instead focus in on regular folks is so important. And there is a, there's another piece to this that I think really matters to candidates, right? In addition to the whose interests are you representing piece, which is incredibly important. Folks who uh, remember my campaigns will likely remember that um, getting money out of politics was a centerpiece of my campaigns. Um, and that was true in large part because of my experience in fundraising for those campaigns. But the other side of this that I think really matters is it also opens up the opportunity to be a candidate, to put your name on the ballot and become part of a government that represents the people to a whole bunch of incredible people and community leaders who otherwise wouldn't have access, right? When, when I started my campaign, um, everybody told me I couldn't run because I didn't have a wealthy network and I didn't have a way to raise a million dollars. And they said, well, then you can't run for office. We have an admission fee for people to get their names on the ballot. And that's fundamentally undemocratic. And by offering small matching funds in this campaign finance program, it means that a teacher or a nurse or a custodian who has great ideas about how to solve community problems and wants to dedicate themselves to public service can actually run a viable campaign because they don't need to have millionaire donors. They can find 250 donors who can make those $10 donations Karen was talking about. And because of the state matching funds, that will give them enough money to actually run a real campaign that can win. So it opens the door to democratic participation and candidacy to the kind of people we need to see in office if we want the kinds of policies that help us make better lives for everybody, right? And that is something that as a candidate, I understand to the very core of my being. <laughs> yes. Well, we're getting near the uh, the end of what I'd like to have as our uh, our runtime here on this program, and I'm definitely going to have you guys back uh, continuing because this program is in its infancy. It will really uh, come into play next year, uh, and so we're going to definitely be talking about it again um, as as we get on because it does affect. The statewide candidates, which won't be next year, but the state Senate candidates and assembly candidates that are on the ballot next year will be the first ones to run with these public matching funds. So, but I always like to end the podcast with my uh, my cheating question, which is, uh, what haven't we talked about? And I'm going to start with you, Karen, and then I'll go to you, Dana. The floor is yours. You can talk about anything you want that we haven't been able to mention. Uh, you know, tell me about your dog, whatever, or some other very important public message. Would I be do, too boring to talk more about public campaign finance? No, 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 that's fine too. So here is how it works. Uh, when you give, uh, let's, let's, if when you give your candidate $10, anywhere between $5 and $50, I should say. Anywhere between $5 and $50, the state uh, will match uh, 12, give 12 times that. So essentially, your small donation becomes that much greater. Right? So between $5 and $50, the state will match 12 to 1. 
uh, between 50 and 100, the state will match nine to one. And between, between 50 and 150, uh, the state will match nine to one. And between 150 and 200, eight to one. So viewers might say, what the heck? That sounds complicated. Why can't it be just, you know, one match in like New York City, for instance? And that is because we want to make sure that the people who are living paycheck to paycheck and want and, and is willing to make a sacrifice by not going to Dunkin' Donuts for that cup of coffee and giving that money instead to their candidate by wanting to be part of this process. We want to make sure that they get the most bang for their buck, right? So essentially, the smaller the donation, the greater. So I think it's great. New York City has had a public campaign finance program for close to 30 years. And last year, uh, or it was the year before, because you know, with COVID, everything is all smooshed together. Uh, I believe it was the year before. Um, city council races uh, using uh, public campaign finance and candidates, like maybe 90% of the candidates who ran for city council use public campaign financing. And the result is that we have the most diverse uh, uh, city council in the history of New York. Okay, the first time that we've had a majority female. And for those of you who are Republican, Republicans are also using uh, uh, this, uh, the, the system in New York. It's a bipartisan system, and Republicans were actually able to get a few more uh, candidates in city, city, in city council. So this is, we've had uh, a diverse in terms of uh, racial and ethnic minorities, diversity in terms of gender, uh, diversity in terms of geography, and first time, uh, first time candidates, right? Uh, so all of the, all of the 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 the, um, the identities identifiers that we follow, uh, more of them were elected, and this is largely because of the public campaign finance system. So looking forward to next year, what if, what if we're able to do something similar? in New York State, what would our budget process be, right? What would we still have to choose between childcare and education? Or would, her, or would, her, would, would there be a reprioritization of all of these programs? And so I will, so, so that mother would no longer have to fight for childcare and be told, or, uh, well, if I give you childcare, I can't give you healthcare, right? No, no, let's have both. So I'm sorry, I'm boring that way. <laughs> no, it's good. It's all good. It's, I love the passion. It's, uh, Dana, what haven't we talked about? Yes. So, um, I will, the first thing we haven't talked about is what can the people who are listening or watching, listening to or watching this podcast do to help ensure that this public campaign finance system is successful. And there is a really important thing that everybody can do. So the system needs, the fund needs about $115 million, both to cover administrative costs, to run the program, and to provide the matching funds that candidates actually will get. And unfortunately, Kathy Hochul, while she put in her executive budget some money for this fund, she put in the executive budget far less than it actually needs, a little bit under $40 million. We need almost three times as much as she recommended. So 
if folks who are listening to this or watching this care about making sure that this public matching system works, they can pick up the phone and call their state senators and tell them that they need to include full funding for this program in their budget recommendations. Um, that is something everybody can do. I'm sure everybody watching this podcast knows how to get in touch with their state senators and do it regularly. So please make that ask. If you wanna call the governor's office and let her know that you want full funding, that would be great too. She would love to hear from all of us upstaters. Um, so that is a, a, a way that everybody can engage and take action and, and help move this forward. Um, other things that we haven't talked about, there's tons, of course, as always, there's never enough time to talk about all the good stuff. Um, but I would just say, because this is an audience of um, politically minded folks, that um, the state legislative elections that Dustin mentioned aren't until next year. And uh, next year, we're going to have congressional and, you know, all the big stuff is going to happen again. But don't forget, that 2023 is also an election year. And there are lots of really important local elections where you can have a significant impact on the policies that shape our day-to-day -day lives. All the things that we've talked about here and many, many more from whether or not the pothole in front of your house gets filled to whether or not, um, kids have great teachers and books and full resources in their schools, right? So um, I hope that everybody is just as excited about participating in, supporting, getting engaged in local elections in 2023. And I will say again, our website is citizenactionny.org. If you want to find out how to get involved in any of the campaign work we're doing, um, we'd love to talk to you some more. You can get information there. You can sign up. You can uh, even find Karen's email address so you can talk to her more about campaign finance. Well, I'd love that. <laughs> well, you you all did an amazing job. And thank you so much for all the work that you're doing for voters and pushing the ball forward on these amazing ideas. Uh, Dana, you already said it, but I'm going to say it again, citizenactionnewyork.org. Go to that website. You're going to be able to find out how you can get involved. Uh, you can get involved here in the Syracuse area. You can get involved in any area that you may be listening to. And call your legislators. If this is if you want the CPFB to be fully funded, call your legislators and make sure that uh, they hear from you that there are people in the public that want this. And I know that there are because uh, it's one of the more popular issues uh, around the in, in polling is to be able to take money out of politics, and this is the best way to do so. Karen, Dana, thank you so much for coming on Zoom with Sarni again, and please uh, uh, keep doing the work that you're doing. Thank you, and, Dustin. And that was my interview with Dana Balter and Karen Wharton of Citizen Action New York. Uh, love the interview. Dana's an old friend of the program. Uh, so happy to have Karen's, uh, you know, uh, testimony a few weeks ago, and also uh, her, uh, you know, interview today talking about the importance of the public campaign finance system that is launching in New York, and the money they need to properly launch this program. Uh, this week uh, on my weekly walk, I'll be doing uh, the Village of Fayetteville uh, as I start focusing on the political subdivisions. Uh, in New York that are or in Onondaga County that are having elections this year. So check that out. And uh, next week on my commissioner car on Tuesday, it'll be a little later uh, as I'll be traveling back from Albany, but my uh, commissioner and car will be on the starting of designating petitions. Um, and then uh, on uh, next, uh, my next Zoom with Zarni next Thursday will be Ben Weinberg, of Citizens Union talking about the proposal to move New York City and statewide elections uh, to even year elections. Uh, we have a long discussion about that and it's a, a great discussion. So tune in next week for that interview. Thank you very much for joining in with Zoom with Zarni this week. 
Remember to go to DustinZarney.com to like and subscribe uh, for free. Uh, you'll never have to pay for it. I'll never have ads on here. This is part of my public outreach. You can get all election news and content updates. So thank you again and enjoy your week. Bye-bye. Thank you.